OWS Week has over the last seven days visited Chicago for Make Wall Street Pay Rally, a slick and well-organized protest action that hit the federal building and Senator Durbin's office. There were 20 arrests, but it was oh so worth it. In Los Angeles, jail the bankers, free the people action in response to the fraudulent foreclosure crisis saw activists from Occupy the Hood, Fuerza Hernandez, and Pueblo Lucero joined by indigenous Tonga people in a march against the banks. Anti-austerity action occupiers from LA organized an autonomous action against austerity in solidarity with Portland occupiers whose anti-austerity action had been met with police brutality. Our correspondent spent Sunday, November 11th, at Occupy Storefront in Runcan, New York. Occupy Storefront has played a central role in the Occupy Sandy relief effort, and we interviewed the storefront's founders. Times Square on U.S. presidential election night was also lit up with OWS protesters, there to highlight the undemocratic two-party system in the U.S. The people, united, shall never be defeated. I'll post to Facebook, I'll find somebody, okay? Melissa, any words for me? The people united will never be defeated. Some good words. Occupy Wall Street is resurgent and garnering mainstream media attention once again, partly because less than two weeks ago the climate went on strike against Wall Street. A storm called Sandy surged the tides, flooded New York City, and turned off the lights. Occupiers did not wait for the state to help the people. OWS stepped in, mobilized the networks they have been building for a year, and declared a state of emergency. The People's Emergency is not a humanitarian operation, and it is not about charity. Occupy and its allies are not a Salvation Army or an administrative agency. Wearing red squares, not red crosses, Occupy Sandy is creating autonomous zones for community and solidarity, not camps for powerless victims. They do not seek to restore things to normal as defined by the ruling elite. They seek to create another world from the ground up. Occupy Storefront in Ronkonkoma, New York is not a store and doesn't sell anything. It's a community activism space run by volunteers and dependent on contributions, mutual aid, and one another. OWS Week caught up with the founders of the storefront for a chat about their central role in the Occupy Sandy relief effort and the movement in general. What do you think about the uh, Obama getting elected? Is that going to change anything? I don't even, you know what, it's funny, um, you know, um, I had to, uh, on election day, I had to really make an, uh, a real effort and make a, like a um, conscious decision to leave the our efforts, because we were just so inundated with getting stuff out, and I was just so, you know, like, I really, uh, I wouldn't say neglect, but avoided a lot of stuff, because I was just really, you know, um, intent on getting things out to people that were in need and I, and I've, I saw some things I've, I've been to the affected areas so that when you go to these affected areas and you see the destruction you see the people you see like you know we've been to like I mean I was in breezy point where all the houses are burnt down I mean it's just you know um so it's kind of stays with you so you don't really but on election day I mean I, I didn't uh, I did vote but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't I didn't vote for uh, what you would call the uh, the big two or anything like that I'm not okay. gonna really say who I voted for I definitely wasn't um, you know, uh, any of the uh, selections that they give us. Over in Los Angeles, occupiers and community activists have been involved in other kinds of cleanup. We're out here today to uh, protest austerity measures, which naturally will be coming soon. Uh, it's already a, a meme within the mainstream media that Barack's been re-elected and stuff. They're giddy with the idea that he's got to pass the grand bargain in order to play nice with Republicans. Um, and then we're also here in solidarity with the students that were pepper sprayed up in Portland, Oregon the other day. What happened there? Um, they had an anti-austerity march and um, uh, Portland police reacted violently with batons and pepper spray. Uh, Grandma Non Wagner was there. They attacked her as well. Wow. Occupiers met at the corner of Wilshire and Western with signs, banners, and flyers for an autonomous action against austerity in solidarity with Portland protesters brutalized by police the day before. 
That night, there was a candle vigil and eviction sleepover protection at the Lucero residence. Indigenous people have expressed concern about using the term fort for a barricaded home, so the Lucero protection is now known as Pueblo Lucero. Fort or not, one thing is certain. The Luceros and their allies are not giving up their home to a foreign bank without taking a stand. The U.S. presidential election was held on Tuesday, November 6th, in the midst of all the cleanup actions coast to coast. A sizable portion of the U.S. electorate dutifully went to the polls and voted for one or the other of the corporate candidates. Some folks stayed home, and some had the audacity of hope to vote for alternative third-party candidates. OWS Week headed to Times Square on election night to see what was happening. Then back to L.A. on November 9th for Jail the Bankers, Free the People. Tomorrow, if you're not doing anything, or even if you are doing something, clear it up. Come on down to uh, Pershing Square at noon uh, for a march against the banksters. We're going to be having to feed the people and uh, distributing food as well. So it starts at noon, we're going to rally there, and then we're going to start marching at around 1. So it's on the 9th? Yeah. yeah. Day after tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow. Yeah, oh wait. Today's Wednesday? Yeah, it's on Friday. It's the day after tomorrow. All right, Friday at noon, free food. Friday at noon, uh, free food at 1 and march at 2. Awesome. Yeah. Is there any update from your house or anything? Yeah, uh, we got a call from the lawyer today. He said he spoke to the sheriffs. Uh, the sheriffs wanted him to know and us to know that they're aware that the, that the bankruptcy state has been lifted and that they have the green light to come and evict us, that they're going to come and do it. In response to the fraudulent foreclosure crisis, activists from Occupy the Hood, Fuerza Hernandez, and Pueblo Lucero were joined by indigenous Tonga people in a march against the banks. Occupiers gathered in Pershing Square for Feed the People. The Tongas blessed those gathered and then led the march. There were brief clashes with the police, but protesters remained peaceful despite LAPD overreaction and no arrests were made. Back off! The Lucero and Hernandez families are just two among millions who have had bank doors slammed in the face of pleas for renegotiation. Foreclosure and eviction protection actions are proceeding across the country. Spirits remain high in Los Angeles. The families realize their resistance may ultimately be in vain, but the struggle is worthwhile. Local, national, and international media attention has been focused as never before. Pueblo Lucero wound up their week with a yard sale and a picnic for their community. Strong in spirit, proud of heritage, with Aztec dancers performing in front of the barricade at day's end. On Friday, November 9th, a coalition of activists gathered in Chicago for a major action on the federal building and offices of Senator Dick Durbin. Thank you all again for coming. Before we leave, I'd like us to review the demands that we presented to Senator Durbin that he found so unreasonable that he wouldn't even talk to us, all right? First, we want Senator Durbin to block the debt ceiling sequester cuts, to say no to budget cuts, say no to austerity. Second, we demand that Senator Durbin reject the Simpson Bowes plan or any other so-called grand bargain that attempts to balance the budget on the backs of the poor, working people, the sick, or the elderly. 
We want no cuts to Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. That's right. Third, we demand that Senator Durbin block the extension of the Bush tax cuts for the top 2%. It's time for the rich to start paying their fair share. And finally, we demand that Senator Durbin support and fight for progressive sources of revenue, including the Robin Hood tax and taxing capital gains as normal income and closing corporate tax loopholes. Yeah! The event was spearheaded by Make Wall Street Pay Illinois, a coalition of grassroots organizations dedicated to protecting investments America has made in health, education, welfare, and retirement security, while ensuring the wealthy Wall Street banks and corporations pay their fair share to support those investments. Our federal government must raise revenue. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we can continue to fund vital programs in our communities, and we need a fair deal. What do we want? Fair deal. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Fair deal. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Fair deal. When do we want it? Now. The rally, protest, and march started at the corner of Van Buren and State Street and was very well coordinated with several elements. Protesters in the street, protesters in the lobby of the federal building, and protesters in Senator Durbin's office. The push was to pressure the senator to choose whether he will serve the interests of Wall Street, big corporations, and the very rich, or the interests of his constituents in the coming budget showdown negotiations. As the people who are gathered for justice, we are declaring that now that the elections are over, Congress We'll be going back to Washington, D.C. to address what we call a fiscal cliff. Ain't that a trip? The U.S. fiscal cliff refers, refers to the effect of a series of recent laws which, if unchanged, will result in tax increases, spending cuts, and a corresponding reduction in the budget deficit beginning in 2013. These laws include tax increases due to the expiration of the Bush tax cuts and across-the-board spending cuts under the Budget Control Act of 2011. What this means for the 98 percent, who is that? Us. Who is that? Us. So what this means for us is drastic cuts to critical social safety net programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, WIC, the Pell Grant, just to name a few. Then, say it. That ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't right. That's not right. <laughs> this would also mean that the wealthiest 2% would continue to receive hundreds of thousands in tax refunds while the rest of us are left with little or no recourse but to meet our basic human needs as best we can. The message of the action was very clear. When Congress returns to Washington after the elections, they face a stark choice. Who should pay for investments in our country's future? Wealthy Americans and big corporations or the rest of us? The Bush-era tax cuts will expire in December providing Congress and the administration a critical opportunity to raise much-needed revenues from the wealthiest 2 percent. Massive across-the-board budget cuts, sequestration, are set to begin in January. This will cut $1.2 trillion in spending over the next 10 years, 
costing millions of jobs and hurting health care, education, aid to state and local governments, and other vital programs. Senator Durbin and other lawmakers working on a grand bargain of $4 trillion in deficit reduction have considered putting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid on the chopping block, in addition to scores of other programs critical to creating jobs and protecting families. With the elections behind us, it's time for Congress and the administration to get to work for the American people, not a handful of CEOs. When the tax dodging ends, investments in jobs and an economy that works for everyone can begin, said George Gohl, Executive Director, National People's Action. On Friday, a few hundred people followed through and presented their demands in an unmistakable manner, with 20 protesters led away in handcuffs for their stand. As one New York occupier involved in Sandy Relief Action put it on Election Day, today we are told we should go out and participate in the so-called political process. Stand up and be counted. Let our voices be heard. Pick the man who supposedly best represents our interests. That's fine. We are not for or against it. We are agnostic. In truth, we are living and dying in another universe altogether. We are aliens from the future who recognize the perils and the promises of our latest disaster. Climate change and capitalism are twin catastrophes and deeply interconnected. The market sees only resources to be extracted, not a world to be shared or communities to be protected. The 1% continue to push for, and the banks continue to finance, more coal, oil, and natural gas, and they don't care how many mountains they destroy or communities they frack to increase their profits. The result is a warmed planet and warmed oceans, where superstorms and dirty energy disasters will be more common. Occupy and its various allies are not rebuilding the status quo. They are building a new world, and they're not going to stop. The 2009 U.S. military budget accounted for approximately 40 percent of global arms spending. The 2012 budget is six to seven times larger than the $106 billion of the military budget of China and is more than the next 20 largest military spenders combined. The United States and its close allies are responsible for two-thirds to three-quarters of the world's military spending. The U.S. military budget, currently standing at $648.6 billion, has risen dramatically over the last 13 years and is the largest in U.S. history. U.S. military spending constitutes nearly as much money as the military spending of all other world countries combined. This does not include many military-related items such as nuclear weapons research, maintenance, cleanup and production, veterans affairs payments and pensions to military retirees and widows and their families, interest on debt incurred in past wars, or State Department financing of foreign arms sales and militarily related development assistance. Neither does it include defense spending that is not military in nature, such as the Department of Homeland Security and counterterrorism spending by the FBI. The invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan are also not included in the military budget figures. The two wars are categorized as overseas contingency operations. By the end of 2008, the U.S. had spent nearly $1 trillion in direct costs on the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Indirect costs, such as interest on the additional debt and incremental costs of caring for the more than 33,000 wounded borne by the Veterans Administration, are additional. Some experts estimate these indirect costs will eventually exceed the direct costs. Whichever way we choose to weigh up the cost of the wars, as of June 2011, the total in Iraq and Afghanistan was standing at approximately $3.7 trillion dollars. Due to the massive cost of the overseas wars, all government funding for education, social security, and health care has been drastically cut back or frozen entirely. Future projects for social security have been placed on hold or written off altogether. 
Education authorities in most areas are currently so underfunded that some teachers have been left with no choice but to pay out of their personal funds to supply much needed equipment to their classrooms and students. Some teachers unions have even chosen to strike to demand better conditions, not for themselves, but for their students. I'm Rhonda McLeod. I work at Gresham School. I'm a special ed teacher who's nationally board certified and highly qualified and with 15 years experience. Tell me how to spell your name because if they M -C, want it, I got to know. capital L-E-O-D. Awesome. Like Mary McLeod Bethune. <laughs> Why are you here? Because we need smaller class sizes. We have a kindergarten room that has 47 five-year-olds in it. We have a seventh grade room with 47 kids. We have a fifth grade room with 38 kids. We have no air conditioning. Friday, my classroom was 92 degrees. I have air conditionings that I, air conditioners I purchased. They will not let me plug them in. I have spent $2,000 on school supplies this summer for my students in Inglewood, Gresham, who don't have the money to buy their own materials. I am still waiting for books. I'm still waiting for materials this year. The computer system for Gradebook was not working, and they spent $60 million on that two years ago. It should work. We deserve assistants who can work. We need money. We need time. It's not about the race. The environment has had to pay a terrible price because of U.S. military adventurism abroad. Dozens of projects to develop green energies have been shelved in favor of quick-fix fossil fuels extraction. The XL pipeline to transport oil from Canada and fracking have not only blighted the landscape in areas of outstanding natural beauty with pollution, they threaten to uproot Native American communities from what little land they live in within their reservations. It is becoming increasingly clear that the path the U.S. government is on cannot be sustained. It is time for the human family to rise up, say enough is enough, and act decisively to stop the ruling elite in their tracks before it is too late. There really is no planet B.